continue to do it. Right. <laughs> I'm not going to do it yet. Can I get you guys even closer? Mm -hmm. Oh my god. Just turn a little bit though, so that you're not like that. That's it. Okay. And then, uh, are we Facebook living? You are Facebook living. Hi everybody, we are uh, here at the Arab American Institute at our offices in Washington DC preparing to release our 2016 poll of Arab American voters. Uh, we are doing it via Facebook Live uh, for the first time ever actually. We typically do a press conference and then we uh, streamed it uh, in previous years, but um, I understand that press conferences aren't as common as they used to be, so we're um, doing the method that folks think uh, seems to be the right one. So we yeah, are... Just, just, just a point. <laughs> the old guy wants press conference. <laughs> That's right. The old guy wants the podium. Um, I'm not quite sure what I want, but we're doing it via Facebook Live because Jen said so, so here we are. Um, we are excited... As my, as my uncle... Farid used to say, this young generator. <laughs> I'm just learning new tricks. So we're, 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 we're on Facebook right now. So That's there right. you go. That's right. Um, part of what we're doing today is, uh, is what we launched uh, a little over a year ago in uh, Dearborn, Michigan with our Yellow Boat um, uh, campaign, mm -hmm. basically. We had our first um, uh, meeting there, uh, conference um, in October, where we assembled our national leadership and talked about the issues that are most important to our community. Uh, we have built upon that year by doing uh, programs across the country, by continuing to work on the policy priorities that were identified then. And part of that has always been uh, framing the Arab American vote. Um, and our polling that's been done on this is, is unprecedented. No one else does it. Um, and we have uh, with us today, of course, uh, the founder and president of the Arab American Institute, Dr. James Zaghi, who uh, did the original polls in the 90s, continues to do them now, and they really do present a snapshot of this community in a way that I don't think anything else out there can. Mm -hmm. So we're happy to be releasing our 2016 poll. I'm not sure that uh, the overall major takeaways will be a surprise, but there are some things in here that are um, uh, certainly interesting data points and things that I think are quite telling about the perceptions of our community versus our reality. Mm -hmm. So we'll start uh, with that. That's, that's, Jim, why don't you, before I even go into any of the specifics, just sort of give us your, your major takeaway. I think the major takeaway is how uh, Arab Americans are like the rest of America. Um, obviously with some differences, but um, we vote for the reasons why everybody else votes, for the issues that everybody else votes. Uh, Democrats uh, are supporting Hillary Clinton overwhelmingly. Republicans are supporting Donald Trump, surprisingly, one might say. Um, independents are breaking very heavily for, for Hillary. Um, and so the overall vote is 60-26, uh, mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so we, as I like to say, we vote like Hispanics these days. Uh, mm -hmm. And our party identification is also like Hispanics. The, as Republicans continue to alienate, um, uh, uh, there's a core group who still hold solid as Republicans, but I think that it was 52-26 in this poll, uh, identifying Democrat. And I think that's that's rather significant because if you look at the chart here, since we've been doing this since 1996, yep, this you can actually important. put it up and you can see that our numbers back in uh, 96 were like the rest of, of, of America, leaning Democrat, 38, 36, and then in 2000, 40, 38, leaning again Democrat, but then opening up as a result of the policies of the Bush administration uh, with the Republican numbers dropping, the Democrat numbers not dropping, and again in 2004, but by the time you get to 2006, it opens up 45, 31, and then 54, 27, and it stays very high with the Republican numbers at 26 now and 52. So that's, I think, rather significant, uh, that, that split. And then when you ask people, why are you voting for Hillary Clinton? Uh, they will say uh, the economy is the number one issue. And then after that comes gun control and health care. Mm -hmm. On the Republican side, why are you voting for Donald Trump? And the main issue is the economy, but then it's, it's, it's Republican issues that, that, that trump terrorism um, uh, being, being principal among them. Um, and 
So they're supporting Hillary for domestic reasons and because they vote Democrat, but um, Republicans are domestic reasons and they vote Republicans. But when you ask them what their next largest issue is, they can't stand voting for Hillary on the Republican side, and on the Democratic side, they can't stand voting for Trump, which is like the rest of America. I was going to say, that's what you love yeah. them, really, is that this is yeah. a constituency very similar to yeah. the rest of the country. Yeah. Numbers were 32% and 31%, I believe, on yeah. anti, anti-Clinton, right. anti-Trump. Anti-Trump, which is pretty much like the rest, like I said, the rest of the country. There's For a lot of Americans, this is a hold-your-nose election, and I think that this comes through in the... In, in the poll. So what's interesting to me on that is that one of the points that's been made repeatedly is that because of this uh, particularly sort of problematic, <laughs> toxic nature of this election, that a lot of voters are turned off, that they may not be participating. We are looking at a uh, very, very different end result for every American voters. Um, we, I don't know if we put that up. We didn't. Okay. It's about a 91%. Say that they're either definitely voting or very likely voting, which is a very high number. Mm-hmm. But we usually get a high voter participation number, and um, and I think this year uh, maybe extremely so, uh, and it could be that the Trump rhetoric has has mm-hmm. contributed to that, um, and you know I mean look at the the, the women numbers are mm-hmm. very high um, for Secretary Clinton and for identifying themselves as Democrat right now. Mm-hmm. Arab American women sixty four percent identifying themselves as Democrat. Um, that would be three percent saying they intend to vote. Yeah, and so I, I think that, again, we're like the rest of the public, but a little on steroids <laughs> right now, just a, a, with a, with an accent mark, I think, uh, for emphasis. One of the things I, I um, very much appreciated about the the fact that we've done these for as long as we have, and then we have the ability to do the examination yeah. cross tabs, is um, um, an issue of the the sixty to twenty six percent number. Within that, when you looked at cross tabs, you found people often draw this distinction between immigrants versus those who were born here, mm-hmm. between uh, Muslims and, and, and the past elections. That was always the case mm-hmm. in the in, in the two thousand four two thousand eight elections, for example. Um, we had a big split between the Maronite Catholic Mel, Maronite Melkite, the Catholic vote, and the Muslim vote, with Muslims much more heavily Democrat. In other words, the the Republican ID mm-hmm. of those who were settled here stuck in 2004 and 2008. They continued to they 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 uh, they continued to want to support the Republican candidate. Um, that didn't happen in this election, and so what you have is the Muslim vote numbers and the Catholic vote numbers mm-hmm. are nearly identical. And 60. again. Sixty-three yeah. percent were looking at Catholic, sixty-seven for Muslim, yeah. native-born, fifty-seven foreign-born at sixty. And and that's also interesting because in the past, uh, those the the strong ID um, was a, a a function of how long you were here in the country. Mm. Um, I grew up Democrat, um, and I call myself a diaper dem. I, I it's culturally a Democrat. I, I kind of don't know what to do to talk to Republicans mm. sometimes. Um, it's just the air you grew up in, the, the, the air you breathed, the water you drank and stuff. It just, that was who we were. Then there were folks in, in, the, in the community and folks on our board who are culturally Republican. They, that's the water they drink and the air they breathe. Um, that's a function of being here for a long period of time. New immigrants, on the other hand, don't have those cultural ties and so much more strongly independent and less inclined to vote, vote party line. Um, that's changed this time. So we would always have a, uh, a stronger a difference between born here, born there. We don't in this poll. The native born versus the, uh, the, the immigrant, almost identical voting pattern. And again, I think it's a result of the way, the degree to which Trump's rhetoric has alienated and frightened people. And you see that also in the, the numbers we get on discrimination uh, and how frightened you are about discrimination in the future. Uh, again, uh, uh, an issue where I think that the, the two groups, the Christian, Muslim, the, the born here, born there, are, are fusing together as a community. Yeah, we'll come back to that, but I think yeah. that's an incredibly important point. Let's shift a bit to the issues of importance. Uh, we do have these up here when asked on domestic priorities. The top two issues came, come up is jobs and economy, 31%. The next one after that was health care. 
Um, you talked a bit about that having a bit of a partisan split. Um, in terms of foreign policy priorities, um, we did at 46%, we had defeating ISIS come up, Syria, and the crisis in Syria comes up at 38% ahead of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict at 34%. Mm. Um, is that different um, in terms of how you see it? No, I, I think that what, what we've got is a, um, uh, again, uh, this is where the emphasis in the country is. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the country's focused on ISIS in Syria. Palestine's become a, 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 a sec The fact that it shows up at 34% is itself significant. Um, and I think um, we certainly saw that in the Bernie Sanders campaign and the reaction of the community to Bernie Sanders talking about the issue. But, um, I, I mean, I, I, if, if we had something other than defeating ISIS as the number one issue, I would have been surprised. Right, right, that makes sense. Um, one of the things we're doing on Facebook Live is taking your questions. Um, so I believe you're able to just hop in and do what one does on Facebook by asking those questions. So we do have a, a, a question from Michael Osterling. Hey, Michael, what do Arab Americans think of Secretary Clinton's hawkish, hawkishness on foreign policy? Well, we didn't ask that question, but, but what's interesting is that when we ask why people are voting for the different candidates, foreign policy doesn't show up at all. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think they're comfortable with the foreign policy of either of the two. Um, and so uh, that's not the reason that they're voting in this election. So, so this is something, Michael asked this, but this is something I, I wanted to find asking you about. Um, the question posed was, yeah. of, of the two, who do you feel would pursue policies that would be beneficial to improving U.S. relations with the Arab world? And 52% um, said Clinton, for sure. Yeah. That's decidedly a higher number. But neither came in at 24%. I actually would have expected the neither to be larger. When I poll in the Arab world, neither comes out larger. Uh, I, I think in this case, it's not so much that Hillary Clinton, 52%, say she'll be better. Uh, it may be better, but better as opposed to it's a low bar mm. with, with, uh, with, with Donald Trump. And I think that that's, that's reflected in it. Yeah, also, the question that she was Secretary of State, she traveled around the region, she knows people. And there's a, a certain comfort level with the fact that she's not going to do something uh, to speak at a rally and sort of humiliate an entire religion, um, <laughs> something of that sort. The bar is low, the as bar you is say. Low. The bar um, is low. We have Omar B. in the house. Hi, Omar. Uh, does foreign policy play a role in uh, Arab American leanings on the candidates, or do they generally give up uh, on both um, from previous election years, I kind of have the sense that Arab American voters care about U.S. and Middle East policy a lot. Um, I, I, think, I think Arab American voters do, and again, you saw that with the Bernie Sanders, re the reaction to Bernie Sanders. But we have two candidates who have espoused policies that most in the community aren't favorably inclined to support, and so um, they're making their decision on other for other reasons. If, if you look in the poll at why they're voting for Hillary or why they're voting for Trump, it's about 10% say, I like her foreign policy or I like his foreign policy. Mm -hmm. um, it's mostly, um, I vote Democrat or I vote Republican or the domestic issues, uh, I, both, or in the, as you note, a third on each side, I can't stand the other guy. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's why they're voting. Foreign policy isn't factoring in. Now, there are some subgroups. Um, I know, for example, there are some in the Syrian community who support the opposition who are hoping that a Hillary Clinton will be tougher. Mm -hmm. I know there are others um, who look at Trump's saying, I'm not going to get involved in Syria. I you know, want to work with Putin. And there are those who support the, you know, the status quo in Syria, and they, they like that. I don't think anybody is finding anything. There were some Republicans who were making a real stretch to say, well, Donald Trump said he'd negotiate a solution to Israel-Palestine, and they liked him for that. But I think you have to really stretch to come up with a reason on foreign policy grounds to support the candidates. Uh, let me ask you about another question that is posed here. Um, what role you feel third parties play in uh, uh, voting for, for Arab Americans? This is a number I actually found surprising. Um, Senator Sanders received a great deal of support from our community. Um, it makes sense after his endorsement and the groundswell of support um, uh, shifting over to, to Secretary Clinton, but the numbers were really quite low for both the Libertarian yeah. and the Green Party candidates. Yeah, I, I at think four percent, I believe. I think that we had a thirteen and a half percent, almost fourteen percent for Nader in mm -hmm. two thousand, 
That was because he was Arab American. And it was because he was right on all of the issues on the Middle East that they cared about. And his vote decidedly came, interestingly enough, from Democrats, not just independents, from Democrats who weren't going to vote for Joe Lieberman for vice president because of Lieberman's positions on Jerusalem. Remember, he had led the fight on the Jerusalem bill, et cetera. Um, and they were, they were upset about that. So uh, people don't remember. They think that, that Bush overwhelmingly won the community. He didn't. Um, he did win it, but Nader got almost 14% of the vote. And if you added the Nader-Gore numbers, you got pretty much what Democrats usually do in the community, over 50%. So it, it, neither Jill Stein nor um, Gary Johnson are, are Ralph Nader's in, in the sense of creating an enthusiasm factor for, especially in this case in 2000, it was the recent immigrant um, or immigrant Arab Americans uh, who were independent who supported him heavily. So one of the things that we had the opportunity to do in this poll, which I thought was fantastic, is that we asked questions about the most pressing um, policy issues today. Mm -hmm. um, and those included immigration policy and the pathway mm -hmm. to legalization, um, as well as policing practices. And um, let's start with the question on police, policing practices. We asked, which best reflects your view on policing practices in the United States? And we had 39% um, saying policing in America needs to be reformed, but not radically. 44% um, of Clinton's supporters, but also 29% of Trump supporters. Mm -hmm. um, I think. That to me was was a was an important and, and indicative number. Well, and, and the number uh, on top of that, which uh, twenty three percent, who said it really needs to be uh, dramatically That's reformed. Right. I mean, there is obviously a concern about police behavior, and from a community that has experienced surveillance mm -hmm. um, and uh, un undue surveillance, I think it was it was logical, and we've seen partnerships in many communities between Black Lives Now. Uh, Black Lives Matter and, uh, and, and, and Palestinian activists supporting each other. I think that there's an affinity there and a mm -hmm. sense that uh, something's got to give and it, it's just not working right. It would, it would have surprised me if those numbers were lower. Right. I, 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 I was also, to be honest, pleased to see them equally as high on Trump supporters, where I'm not yeah. sure a different community of Trump supporters poll yeah. would answer that yeah. question yeah. that yeah. way. Um, on immigration, um, how to resolve the issue of undocumented immigrants. Um, I believe that undocumented immigrants with no criminal record currently in the United States should be able to uh, find a pathway to legal status. 70% agree with that statement. You know, I, my dad was undocumented. I've told that story before. Uh, got amnesty in the 30s and became a citizen in 1940. I told that story the first time in public at an event we were doing for Donna Shalala when she was Secretary of Health Human mm -hmm. Services. We were giving her an award here at the Institute. Um, and um, I told the story about my dad. And then Mary Rose Okar, who was, actually I was introducing Mary Rose to introduce Donna. Uh, Mary Rose got up and she said, um, my father was also uh, an illegal immigrant. And then Donna Shalala got up and she said, let me join the party. My grandfather came here uh, undocumented. And so, if you look back in most of our families, there's somebody who was undocumented. And so there's a sensitivity there, I think, on the part of the, the community on this issue. And uh, I don't think we've understood it or worked with it enough. But the partnerships we can build with folks in the Latino community over this issue, real important because, look, we had a period of 30-something years when we got zeroed out in the, in, the, in the immigration because we were, as Senator David Reed in the 20s said, no more Syrian trash in America. Um, and that included everybody from the Levant was back then, it was 1920s. Um, when you have suffered as a community as we did, when you look at the language about us, Linda Jacobs' book and the mm -hmm. sort of the treatment of the Syrian immigrants in New York and the, they were called, you know, just the dirt. Uh, they were treated like dirt. and. And, and therefore were viewed as parasites and eliminated from the census as a threat to the well-being of America. There's a sensitivity there for right. immigration from people coming for uh, whatever reason to find better opportunities in America. Uh, no, I think that's been the natural sort of coalitions that have taken place partly because of that. Um, before we shift to the final piece of it, which I want to talk about in terms of um, identity 
and um, um, uh, the sort of discrimination question. We, we did ask some legacy questions of the Obama administration. Um, and it, the three issues identified as most important we've talked about already. Mm -hmm. So the response to ISIS, the ending the conflict in Syria, and resolving the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Of those identified as sort of the three priority issues, um, <clears throat> what he's been viewed as most ineffective on, 60% believe that it's Syria, followed by p resolving the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and then uh, defeating ISIS. The very issues identified as the top priority are the ones where he mm -hmm. received the poorest ratings on. Mm -hmm. um, did you speak a bit to, to that? I mean, not surprised. I actually was surprised that the president got as high a job approval rating as overall. he got. Mm -hmm. Overall. No, not on domestic policy, I think it, it's mm -hmm. fine. It, it, it's deserved. I mean, frankly, given the crisis we were in and, and how it worked. But that, that even 44% said he uh, did well in foreign policy, I thought was a... Uh, was a bit of a, a bit of a Because he's well liked by our community. So well liked and deservedly so. I mean, in terms of the the way he has tried to be as responsive as he as he as he could. But when you talk specifics, when you say yeah, yeah. policies in the Arab world, uh, positive nineteen percent, forty percent, somewhat positive. I guess the somewhat positive is a sort of a ho hum. But I'm not even sure that he warrants that, given uh, the degree to which he has sort of surrendered. Uh, ground on Israel-Palestine, on dealing with Syria, on effectively, basically managing our relations in the in in the region. So I actually was surprised. Uh, I don't want to close um, on a negative point, but I do want to go to um, the discrimination piece of this. Uh, you yeah. mentioned it in the beginning. Uh, Fifty percent of Amer Arab Americans have uh, experienced discrimination. Uh, the number that I want to highlight is uh, Arab Americans who are Muslim. Uh, came in at 63%, even higher, but even more importantly, millennials, um, the uh, 18 to 24 age bracket at 65%. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked a lot about the sort of post 9-11, post electing the first African American president, uh, post ISIL, there's this churning <laughs> of, of where we are as a country and not having you know come out of this just yet. Um, what is your sense on, on the, those numbers in terms of having experienced them and the idea that they're worried about having more come their way. Well, you know, look, folks who are more on the front line, um, that would be kids on campuses, small grocers, small, small store owners, women, um, are going to experience discrimination more than uh, doctors, uh, you know, folks out in the professional world, uh, or stay-at-home folks. Um, and so the student numbers... We've seen, ever since 9-11, the student numbers are always high, because on college campuses there is that tendency to experience that. I mean, there's a lot of noise being made by Jewish students about how uh, Palestinian activism threatens them. For God's sake, daily life threatens a lot of our kids on campuses, uh, simply because they're Arab. Uh, and if they're Muslim, it's a double whammy. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's an issue. and and. And there's no question that, um, as we've seen this situation intensify over the years, especially after Obama was elected and the rhetoric intensified uh, toward foreign, I think that the, the concern is, is there real and is growing. And so um, we actually need uh, to turn that around, but I'm not finding the national leadership mm. effectively turning it around. I want to... Um, um I want to close with um, a question about identity. We always ask um, the identity question, and it's about how we identify. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, um, you know, we, we talk about this. I tell this story about you and the other four founders of this institution in the 80s, in some ways, really helped create a community of Arab Americans. Um, we weren't allowed to be a, a regular hyphenated community at the time. We were sort of a fake. Um, Look, we face, we face threats internal and external, and the external threats are the folks from the Israel lobby who deny our legitimacy and have mm -hmm. done so since the 70s when they called us a petrodollar fiction. Um, we also faced uh, um, threats from bigots uh, who, for whom Arab was, uh, was taboo. We also faced the internal threat of, of in our own community, an older generation who, when they heard Arab, thought of an ideology, not an ethnicity, mm -hmm. um, and of 
those who bring the divisions of the Middle East, whether religion or country of origin. I always tell the story of a Lebanese ambassador who, after the Civil War, was visiting our office and said, how do you, or yeah, how do you organize your staff? And I, I told him by function. And he said, no, 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 the young man out front, he's Shia from Lebanon, right? And I said, actually, I don't know, I never asked him. The sense that we had to adhere to those divisions, whereas in fact, we've got folks in the office right now who I don't know where their parents came from. I don't know what religion they are. I always joke that if the name's not Muhammad or George, I couldn't tell you whether it was Muslim or Christian. We don't ask. It's, it's an ethnic community that supports each other. And so when I look at the results of the poll consistently uh, over the years, it makes me feel great that a majority of our community identify as Arab American at this point. And especially among the generation born here, but also among the immigrant generation, both, there's a sense that being part of a broader community um, dominates their, their, their identity as opposed to their focus just on their country of origin or just on their religion. Uh, it's true for Christians, Muslims, born here, born there, across the and across the board, whatever country they come from, they want to see themselves as part of a larger community. That's great Excellent. and important for our future. Excellent. Thank, thank you. you. Anything else you'd add, Jen? That's it. Well, thank you so much for being part of our first face Facebook Live uh, poll press release, press release, press conference, whatever you want to call it. Um, our poll is now up live on our website at uh, aaiusa.org. I uh, you know we live tweeted this event. Uh, our hashtag, nope, uh, yes, our hashtag is yellow vote as well as uh, AI poll. Uh, please follow us on Twitter. Uh, continue asking your questions. We'll be happy to answer them. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.